her connection's all okay. So will they leave her on for the whole time? Uh, good afternoon. So we might get started so we can keep to time. Um, I know it's a busy agenda this week. Um, so great to see so many of you uh, here for this session on Just Transition. And I hope you're enjoying the first day of the Asia Pacific Social Protection Week. Uh, my name is Kate Hughes. I'm a principal climate change specialist in ADB's climate change team uh, and one of the leads on Just Transition for ADB. Uh, in order for developing member countries to achieve their development goals, we know that climate change must be addressed and that this will need economies and societies to transition rap rapidly to net zero. And while climate action is often seen as a trade-off to economic development, it should be viewed as a significant economic opportunity for our region. But the speed and scale of the transformations needed are unprecedented and will be disruptive. These disruptions can be opportunities to create quality jobs, develop green industries, and bridge development gaps, such as gender inequality. But they also present socioeconomic risks that must be identified and managed. They could exacerbate pre-existing inequalities and disproportionately impact disadvantaged social groups and sectors. The Paris Agreement on Climate Change of 2015 recognised this risk and committed parties to taking into account the imperatives of a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development priorities. Subsequent climate agreements, including the most recent one at COP27 last year, have reinforced this commitment and we have seen a really rapid growth in engagement on the issue of just transition over the last two years. This has seen just transition being placed at the center of climate initiatives, such as the Just Energy Transition Partnerships signed between the international partners groups and South Africa and Indonesia with other countries under discussion. ADB committed to the M joint MDB principles on just transition in November 2021. We also have a Just Transition support platform to provide technical assistance on strengthening institutional capacity of DMCs to implement Just Transition and develop Just Transition projects. We're also developing our Just Transition institutional approach, leveraging existing policies and processes. Just Transition is also an integral part of ADB's energy transition mechanism and this is where we're at a really critical stage of translating high-level commitments into workable and practical approaches. 
While there's broad conceptual agreement on the need for a just transition, practical approaches, particularly in Asia and Pacific, are nascent. We know from many troubled transitions in the past that the transition will not happen in a just manner without intervention. So proactive efforts and enabling policies are needed to address potential labour market misalignments and distributional impacts and to protect and reskill workers who lose their jobs. Even with robust policy frameworks and programs to aid this transition, there will be changes in the nature, location and magnitude of demand for social protection. This will come at a time when governments are facing fiscal challenges associated with transition as industries, particularly fossil fuel industries, wind down, which will impact government royalties and tax revenue. This is also at a time of increasing borrowing cost and other fiscal pressures. Just transition needs a systematic approach that recognises how challenges are interconnected. Governments need support to understand and plan for a multidimensional issue that involves broad stakeholders, both within and outside government. And all of this must be predicated on a truly inclusive and participatory process. This requires collaboration between multiple stakeholders. And I'm so pleased to have uh, expert panelists today who represent some of the key institutions working on this issue. We're looking forward to hearing your insights. Firstly, Christina with the keynote speech, followed by panelists' response and then discussion. There's also time for audience question and answer at the end, and I really strongly encourage you to participate and ask questions. So without further delay, let me please introduce you to Christina Dankmeyer, who's the advisor on Just Transition Financing Initiative and Social Protection at GIZ. She's also formerly ILO Social Protection and Climate Change Specialist. Over to you, Christina. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having invited me to speak, uh, not just on the panel, but also now the keynote. Um, when we talk about a changing world, we often talk about the challenges that come with climate change. And we hope that with uh, this session, we can actually focus a bit more on the opportunities of the process of transitioning to a climate resilient and decarbonized uh, future to change people's lives for the better. And so when we first discussed this session, Kate said to me that now, you know, as we have a solid common understanding of the conceptual side, what just transition means, we can focus on moving towards implementation. But with all things climate change, uh, you can never be too sure there is agreement. So we actually wanted to make sure that this overview includes a little bit uh, of the conceptual side as well. So um, with the next slide, I would like to just briefly um, make sure we're all on the same page regarding the concept of just transition, since there is not necessarily an international agreed definition, but we will refer to the uh, 2015 ILO Just Transition Guidelines, and as you can see, there are quite a few policy areas included in the concept of just transition as it is defined there, including social protection. And I think this is a really important point. Uh, often when we talk about a just energy transition, um, it is not necessarily recognized that social protection is in fact required uh, to achieve a just transition. And so um, the concept here talks about, I mean, not just minimizing um, emissions, but also minimizing um, the negative impacts on people and actually maximizing uh, climate actions and opportunities for people. Um, so maybe moving on relatively quickly to the role of social protection with the next slide. Um, so obviously uh, everybody in this room will know um, the core function of social protection, um, looking at preventing or reducing poverty and vulnerability. Um, but it is also apparent that with increasing and more severe shocks and also longer term stresses, um, we need to extend that function to also protect people from these shocks and stresses. So that's essentially where we are now. 
But there's also emerging evidence um, that especially social assistance programs, cash transfers, in some cases even without changes in their design, may um, without even an explicit environmental objective um, increase or have a direct effect on the beneficiary's land use and con conservation behaviors and uh, so support climate action in the long term. But for a transition to actually succeed for each and every one, people will not only need to adapt and so adopt sustainable behaviors and practices and diversify uh, their livelihoods and in invest in more sustainable ones, but we also need to make sure that the arising negative impacts of climate policies that may come um, for example, in terms of job losses, uh, price increases, or also implications for, for income and consumption, um, will have to be cushioned to some extent. And people also will need social protection to actually um, get the resources and also have the time to further develop their skills and, and access uh, new decent employment opportunities. And so I would focus on these three areas that you see on the right. So first of all, incentivizing sustainable behaviors and practices, compensating um, negative potential negative policy impacts, and also supporting labor market transitions. Starting with the last one, we can go to the next slide. Um, so in countries that have already undergone major transitions, we, um, as for example, moving away uh, from coal, we have seen big changes that occur in, in labor patterns and also see significant misalignments in the labor market throughout the process because jobs uh, lost and also jobs created may not necessarily occur at the same time. Uh, they don't cluster in the same communities, regions, or countries, and they also affect different sectors of the economy. And also new jobs and sectors require different skills than existing ones in declining sectors. And so the measures that you see in the big figure here are not new um, by any stretch, but their integration will be particularly important given the extent of changes in a very short amount of time that we need and significant educational and also sectoral, uh, sectoral requirements in the transition. And so this became quite clear in the example of the German transition away from coal, which Kate asked me to, to touch upon as well. Um, although the German system already covered a large proportion of the population through mandatory coverage, um, the just transition of coal miners in, in Germany and, um, and also coal miners' families was actually facilitated uh, most notably by unemployment protection and pensions and also social protection measures linked to skills development and employment services. And so that included, for example, addressing uh, costs associated with vocational training for both employed and unemployed people, um, also supporting uh, transportation, for example, um, offering job placement support through job centers um, and employment services generally free of charge. Um, but also reimbursement of application costs, uh, travel expenses, um, and also looking at new requalification measures, especially for older job seekers. And so you can already see that it's a very large package of different interventions that eventually has to come together to make this work. And maybe just a quick note that this doesn't just apply to the transition away from coal, but we've also seen in other countries, I see Australia here, um, we saw the example of the automotive um, industry uh, structural adjustment process, which followed um, major plant closures. And there you see very similar needs and also demands from uh, former workers and their families arising throughout this process. Now moving on to cushioning the negative impacts of climate policy responses. Um, so obviously there are many negative implications that can arise beyond just the labor market throughout this process. So we see price increases um, not just in the context of carbon pricing or um, fossil fuel subsidy reform, but we may also see price increases because of investments in climate neutral or climate resilient infrastructure. Um, there may be private investments needed, um, for example, in assets uh, such as heat pumps, for example. Um, and there may also be potentially costly changes for individuals um, in sustainable 
um, practices and behavior through also regulation. So for example, making deforestation illegal. And so here during this session, we'll just mainly focus on um, the higher cost of living, at least in the short term, even though that may balance out over time, um, and look at countries' measures that can address these. And so um, what we've seen recently is that countries often use price control um, measures, but are slowly now um, also increasingly moving towards income support measures um, to cushion uh, different policy impacts. Um, price control measures, very uncommon term for the social protection world, but it's essentially a broader term for controls that fix or cap um, the price of different products, uh, reduction in taxes, fees, um, excises. So you may also refer to a lot of these measures as, as subsidies. Um, and also, um, yeah, rebates, for example, different um, discounts or exemptions as well. Um, but what we see now is that countries, um, so we've seen in, in the context of recent price increases for other reasons, so also the Ukraine uh, conflict, that countries um, have moved increasingly from price controls towards income support, finding that subsidies may not be quite so conducive to adjusting demand, um, may also weaken price signals, and may still cost a lot. And measures may not necessarily um, meet the needs of all those affected. Um, so for example, in, in some countries, income tax uh, reductions actually excluded um, large parts of the population, especially the informal economy, as we heard in previous sessions, that is an issue for many uh, low and middle income countries. And so this leads us to transition-related support uh, that potentially integrated in social protection systems actually allows for a more um, cost-effective and sustainable policy response, especially if prices actually remain at a higher level for a longer period of time. And so we now have a range of different design options, and some of them may actually be familiar to you already. So existing programs can actually be uh, expanded to support an increased number of, of people, um, so we see that in, in this context as well. Portugal recently permanently uh, updated its social support index by, I think, 8% last year, which is essentially the basis for its income support measures. And this uh, change actually affected 1.2 million people um, in terms of uh, existing beneficiaries, but also additional beneficiaries now being included in these support measures. Um, but expanded social protection programs may not automatically uh, account for the rather heterogeneous effect um, of price increases across households beyond income. Uh, so considering other factors, housing, um, household composition, access to affordable energy, um, energy efficiency measures and public transport may be necessary to also include. And so certain supplements can actually be provided basically as top-up, so to say, to existing uh, measures to uh, reduce the financial vulnerability of um, these households to higher costs of living. Um, one example was Spain last year. They uh, permanently increased their annual thermal social bonus um, to address energy poverty, um, which was essentially linked to their social bonus for um, low-income households, pensioners, disabilities, uh, large families as well, so basically making sure that other factors beyond just income are actually taken into account um, when designing these measures. And then the same adjustments can be made to contributory schemes, so we can actually also consider top-ups, expansion, uh, design tweaks, also in terms of reducing or temporarily suspending or postponing um, the payment of contributions, for example. So I think this is something that is often forgotten when we look at the ways to um, actually reach a larger number of people. And so there's a growing body of literature now also that looks at revenues from environmental policies that are actually better recycled, so to say, towards a reduction of uh, social security contributions than, for example, using them to promote renewable energy or towards indirect or, or capital taxes. And so this is something to follow over the next months and years. Um, I was going to spend a little bit of time on design and practice in terms of promoting sustainable behaviors, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just move to financing so we can cover that as well. Um, so climate change, 
mitigation policies can actually generate fiscal space to complement existing social protection financing mechanisms and actually in the process also help cushion the effects of climate change um, policy responses. And I think it's just important to consider it's definitely not a quick fix for social protection. Revenues are often relatively small, especially if we look at, for example, carbon pricing um, to expand social protection significantly. Um, but still, we need to figure out what the most effective use of these additional, even though limited, uh, resources is for maximum gains for social protection. And so we recently um, commissioned a study um, with SASPRI actually to simulate, first of all, the impacts of selected climate change mitigation policies. So it looked at carbon pricing and fossil fuel subsidy reform, um, as well as which social protection uh, reform options would be the most promising ones to actually address uh, negative impacts on people. And so this was done in, uh, for Indonesia, Vietnam, Ecuador, uh, South Africa, Tanzania, and Zambia to get a relatively broad range of different countries. And the three reform scenarios for social protection considered were topping up existing benefits, uh, expanding coverage to more people, and new um, introduction of categorical benefits. And it's interesting to see, I mean, first of all, it confirms all these reform scenarios would actually cushion the overall drop uh, in mean income and consumption, more significantly at the bottom of the distribution, um, not with the same effects towards the top. Um, in three countries, uh, it actually, so looking at, um, yeah, three countries in total, it actually uh, showed that increasing the value of existing tax finance benefits uh, leads to a more significant reduction of poverty. Um, I think the fourth country was Indonesia, specifically focusing on the Family Hope uh, program um, that would also have that effect to increase the value. Um, but we also saw that where we have already existing um, large coverage gaps, uh, the same is not true. So here, the higher coverage scenario, for example, in South Africa and in Zambia, was actually much more promising in terms of reducing poverty. And then the final lesson was Introducing categorical benefits for entire um, vulnerable groups has an impact on stabilizing income and consumption in, in most of those countries. Um, but we also saw that categorical benefits for specific groups are rather a good option for countries where poverty is not concentrated at the bottom of the income consumption distribution. So for example, Tanzania and Zambia. And so um, maybe just to move to the Last slide with one final, uh, next slide, yeah. With one final, um, there we go, one final <laughs> message um, for reforms before we actually start this process of looking at different options. We need to know what the current social protection system looks like because we see that the shortcomings of the existing system are actually amplified when introducing climate change mitigation measures and different transition um, policies. And so these shortcomings actually need to be considered when designing social protection for just transition reforms. And also one note on countries with higher carbon footprints, they are in a much better situation because their potential uh, revenue from, for example, carbon pricing would enable them much more to increase existing benefits and to broaden the coverage. So we also need to look at the international perspective in terms of um, financing for different countries. And I'll leave it at that, and we'll look at the um, outlook and the um, international commitments in the discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Christina, and a really um, good way to set the scene for, for the session. Um, so we do have one panelist uh, joining us online, because unfortunately she was unable to um, to travel. So Saranjali is online. I'll just see if she can come up so she can join the session. Hi, Kate. I'm Hi. online. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, so we have three great panelists now to, to join Christina in the discussion. Um, and I asked each of them to start off with uh, five minutes of reflection or um, 
comment, I guess, on the, the topic of just transition. One of the things that we find is it's such a multidimensional issue that everyone comes from a different area of expertise, everyone comes with a different perspective um, and how we try to bring them all together in, in terms of coordinated support for countries is one of the biggest challenges. Um, so first we have Masuho Okimoto Kawatatip, who's the regional team leader and advisor for inclusive growth in the Bangkok regional hub of the UNDP. Um, so Masuho, please go ahead first, thank you. Um, so thank you. Um, I was asked to um, reflect on um, what it takes to um, reorient social protection system in the context of just transition and to reflect on a few examples from what UNDP does. Um, and I think maybe just wanted to start off by, um, from UNDP's perspective, re reorienting social protection in, in the context of just transition means enhancing people's resilience and also capabilities. Um, so not just sort of you know, protective, but a, um, a transformative and um, you know, enhancing capabilities is a very important uh, thrust in our approach. Um, as you know, UNDP also has a, a number of climate and environmental projects that address the twin objective of, of sustainability and also reducing vulnerabilities. Um, just a few examples from the, this region. In China, we support equipping farmers with awareness and new skills to adopt alternative um, cultivation practices that rely on, le on, on less um, pesticide. And that is also a contribution towards advancing um, the progress towards Montreal Protocol that uh, seeks to support uh, the reduction of use of chemicals that affect the um, ozone layer. And um, these um, so skills development um, and also um, trainings, they support uh, multiplier effects on the people's um, socioeconomic um, aspects of, of, of families and and the farmers, including um, you know, improved income, but also that these cultivation practices are uh, replicated across different families in the community. And also at the policy level, um, there are uh, mechanisms to promote um, alternative cultivation practices. Um, Indonesia, um, we support enhancing awareness and skills um, and also economic empowerment of women who work in the plastic and electronic waste recycling sector. Um, and that, that really exposes them to hazardous uh, chemicals, and also they are largely in the informal sector. And uh, this includes also enhancing the uh, understanding and implication of such waste on families' health, uh, and also equal wage between men and women, so a multiple aspects of um, enhancing socioeconomic well-being of the families. In the Philippines, this is a project that already completed, but we um, supported weather index-based uh, insurance um, that also complements the traditional insurance, crop insurance mechanism. And this enabled um, rapid payments um, to register recipients, and to, so that enabled them to restart um, planting um, in the same cropping cycle when the uh, natural disaster uh, or extreme weather condition affected them, and that prevented them from in being indebted um, uh, to buy seeds and fertilizers. Um, we are also very strong on analytical aspects, and in India we supported the baseline analysis of um, socioeconomic situation of Safai Satis, who are waste pickers and also um, sweet street sweepers, understanding, identifying what are the bottlenecks or the exclusion factors uh, from social protection, including like identification cards, access to bank accounts, etc. Um, and uh, rate um, recommendations around strengthening the inclusion of um, these informal sector workers in the social protection system. We're also carrying out a number of um, analysis also in Bangladesh. Our colleagues are here in Pacific um, forthcoming. Um, so just maybe to summarize, I think um, the renewed role of social protection from UNDP's angle is really addressing the new uh, and concurrent socioeconomic and environmental challenges on poverty and inequality and social vulnerabilities. Um, but also that these have implications, the implications of structural transformation, including low carbon, green, blue, and transition, intertwine um, with these new um, uh, vulnerabilities and that impact 
also on the lar labor market and, and people's vulnerabilities. So therefore, the, going back to the point about enhancing capabilities and capacities, the acquisition of new skills um, and technologies are very important to our approach, um, in particular to uh, make sure that they form part of future employment profile and um, enhance the people's capacity to take advantage of these um, new job opportunities in the job market. Um, and again, also through that, uh, to develop the human and cognitive capital of, um, of the workers affected, but also of the families, um, I mean, including on the services like nutrition, et cetera, are all um, part of this capability building. And I think the final point is um, on our leaving no one behind agenda that we consider these um, uh, structure transformation, new forms of vulnerabilities um, have impact on different and diverse population groups, so the, the impact is not um, even, and therefore the social protection will need to con consider how um, the, um, the impact of um, these changes and transition have um, impact on different population groups from young to old worker, women, and also um, um, informal sector workers and also persons with disability. Maybe I'll stop here and turn back to Kate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mizuho. And I think, um, you know, your point about enhancing capability and approaching um, the support from that lens resonates with what both Christina and I mentioned about um, the opportunities of the transition. I think there's often a misconception that just transition is about um, a risk mitigation agenda um, and, and coming in to, to clean up or mitigate impacts once they've occurred. But what's really essential is that we see this perspective of early interventions to support people to, to upskill and harness those opportunities that there are. Um, so now, Ipe, I'd like to turn to you um, and introduce Ipe, Ipe Saruga, who's the Social Protection Program Manager um, for the Country Office for Indonesia and Timor-Leste for the ILO. Um, the ILO is obviously one of the key stakeholders in the Just Transition agenda um, and came out with the, the first set of guidelines um, that many people follow. So, um, Ipe, over to you. Thanks. No, thank you very much. Uh, I hope the ILO can lead the discussions, of course, and um, I, I will do my best to bring the Indonesian case um, and can, some kind of Indonesian flavors, country flavors, to the discussion today. Um, in, in my view, there are two major uh, challenges that Indonesia will face in the coming maybe 20 years, 10 years. In the short run, uh, it, as you probably know, Indonesia is a disaster-prone country. So it's, uh, every year, there are a lot of uh, flood cases, landslide cases, and uh, you can name any kinds of uh, climate-related risks, and um, Indonesia is quite exposed to these uh, kind of risks every year. So this is a short-term uh, uh, challenge the countries need to deal with every year. In the long run, uh, the government of Indonesia aims to uh, uh, exit, retire uh, coal-fired power plants uh, to achieve a zero, net zero emission by 2060. So the government uh, aims to close down the entire industries. So of course it is expected that uh, there will be a lot of unemployed workers and then a lot of job creations in a new uh, renewable energy industries. So there will be the transformation of jobs and workers and businesses from one sector to the other sectors this will happen in 10, 20 years' time. Um, so what can social uh, protection schemes do? Um, there are a number of social insurance, social assistance schemes in place in Indonesia. Uh, for instance, uh, if a flat and a landslide uh, affect, destroy the communities, workplaces, employment to injury insurance schemes can possibly support uh, employees, when they get injured in workplaces or die in workplaces, the employment injury insurance benefits will be paid to, to themselves as a disability benefits or uh, survivors benefits to widow, widows and orphans. Uh, if injuries and a death uh, take place outside the workplaces, pension can provide the di disability benefits and, uh, and the survivors benefits. Uh, and these schemes cover 30 million uh, Indonesian employees out of 50 million for uh, employment injury insurance. Uh, 
and about 10 to 15 million uh, workers are enrolled in the pension schemes. What, the scheme, probably you may uh, be interested more on uh, unemployment insurance, role of the unemployment insurance scheme. Uh, the government of Indonesia started the implementation of unemployment insurance schemes last year. And that program provides 45% uh, of income replacement up to three months after dismissal. And uh, the following uh, three months up to six months, 25% uh, of previous income will be paid. Um, so that scheme can certainly have potential to facilitate a transition in a just manner. Uh, while uh, searching for jobs, unemployed workers can possibly have uh, unemployment benefits and public employment supports from uh, labor offices, uh, including the job matching services, job counseling services, and the referral to uh, new employers for job opportunities, and then also access to uh, reskilling, upskilling opportunities. So that uh, the unemployment insurance benefits can be the entry point uh, for accessing these services. Um, but of course, um, these, uh, Indonesia still has a lot, uh, a lot of uh, issues to be improved. Uh, for example, in the unemployment insurance doesn't uh, provide uh, protections uh, for workers who whose contract is expired. But in practice, uh, a majority of Indonesian workers work with the fixed-term contract. It means short-term contract or contract based, not permanent contracts. And then by the labor law, employers are required to pay severance if they dismiss the workers. So in practice, what will happen is that uh, employers will wait until the contract will be expired. And then unemployed workers will have no access to unemployment benefits as well because it doesn't provide coverage. So it needs to be improved. Uh, at the same time, uh, micro-enterprises are not required to register their employees on a monetary basis. But as you can expect, a majority of enterprises in Indonesia are micro-enterprises. So extending legal coverage uh, on a monetary basis to micro-enterprises can have a potential to to increase the coverage to 15 million additional uh, employees alone. Con construction workers, there are 8 million workers that are uh, enrolled in the uh, social security system, but they are not covered by the scheme. So legal coverage alone, extension of legal coverage alone have a huge potential to uh, improve the protection. So I want to close it here, but the lessons from Indonesia can be that as Christina mentioned, we need to look at individual schemes and uh, contingency climate risks and what uh, available schemes can do. And if not, some kind of specific schemes is needed to provide uh, protections. Thank you. Thank you, Ipe. Um, and I think, you know, you, you highlighted some of the twin challenges that we're facing, right, with increasing climate impacts, but also this need to rapidly transition um, whole sectors and industries, and it's the poor and vulnerable that suffer the, the most in both of those, those cases, right? And I think the other interesting point was your, your point on contracts. Um, you know, we find with some of the projects and programs that you're trying to pursue to encourage transition, you also want to make sure that you don't create the situation where um, there's misincentives for, for people to terminate contracts early or, or to wind down jobs in anticipation of something that's coming before it actually occurs. Um, so we'll now turn to, to India, which is another country, obviously, that is very um, central to the discussion on just transition. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have Saranjali Tandon, Tandon with us, who's the Associate Professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy in New Delhi and also a visiting senior research fellow at the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, and Saranjali has done a lot of work on, on the issue of just transition and particularly on um, how we finance just transition. Um, so over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, so just transition is a difficult topic for India uh, because it involves talking about what will happen to coal or coal's future. 
um, over the last year and a half, there's been some increased uh, receptiveness uh, on the topic. We've seen that, you know, the Apex think tank for India, which is the Niti Aayog, had earlier put out a report on the on the phase down plan for coal and what the just transition strategy should look like. We also see strategic partnerships being built uh, along with multilateral organizations. So, for example, the Ministry of Coal is working with the World Bank on a just transition program, which is basically not just about uh, you know transitioning away from fossil fuels and the big net zero plan, but also today India has mine closures which may not be managed well and uh, you know the experiences show us that there is loss of livelihood there is a loss of jobs uh, and so that needs to be managed much better so what we're seeing is there is now an increased understanding or interest in what just transition means i'd like to talk about quickly um the setting of you know the context in india and the dimensions that need to be thought through uh, when talking about just transition, I think the first important one is the loss of revenues. So for a country where there is dependence on coal, um, as well as other fossil fuels for uh, not just national tax revenues, but also sub-national level, I think uh, what we are expecting is that these revenues will decline. That automatically means that you know there is a reduction in fiscal space available to do uh, what needs to be done on SDGs, which I think are linked to the core of uh, what just transition in India is. So uh, today, just to give you a perspective today, about a fifth of the revenues for the government are from fossil fuels. So uh, you're just linking it back to the first presentation, the importance of designing new ways of raising revenues, whether this is through pricing, new taxes, uh, that I think needs to be thought through and it has to be calibrated so that dimension needs to take care of the just transition angle. Uh, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is the initial engagement in the private sector. So, so far our understanding is the private sector does not move to sectors which may be aligned with just transition, which would mean that, you know, they're focused around reskilling, around creation of new jobs. But what we're seeing, there are early signs of engagement with private sector. There are uh, national level banks that have mutual funds. So, for example, the State Bank of India, uh, which has a mutual fund, which is engaging as an investor with companies in the hard to bid sectors to ask what their plan is uh, in order to implement a just transition. So, it's not about just going to net zero, uh, but it's also about what you're going to do with your employees as well as your consumers. And we have the new uh, reporting framework in place. Uh, which puts at its center consumer communities as well as um, employees. In the last year has also been, um, or this year rather, has been rather interesting because you have the first sovereign green bond issuance by the government of India. And, you know, on the face of it, it looks like it's, it's heavily focused on green, but if you go through the framework, it talks about a co-benefit approach. And I think the linking of what we do on climate action to the results that can be achieved uh, in the social dimension is also something very important. Uh, we have the uh, reg securities market regulator also talking about an expanded scope of bond issuances in India, which goes beyond green. So it talks about um, transition bond framework as well. And I think uh, historically uh, for India, we've used our banking sector, which still seems to be the main source of finance. Um, we've used our banking sector to target our priorities and um, through something called the priority sector lending. And we, what we are seeing is that you know there are elements there, for example, lending to MSMEs, which are core or important uh, to this transition through the value chains, as well as through the employment uh, dimension. Uh, which 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 can be used. We can use banking finance uh, as well uh, to leverage um, a just transition. But just to put it all together, that there are financial innovations underway. Uh, but at the same time, there needs to be also focus on how we uh, look at our fiscal strengths. And this is also important for multilateral organizations or um, lending organizations that go to a country like India. 
uh, to carry out uh, stress tests to fiscal position. And it's not just about raising revenues, I think. Um, some of the few states, for example, Odisha is a state which is disaster prone, uh, has taken initiatives to map its budget to look at fiscal risks that can arise from such events. And um, I think that needs to be done across states that could be uh, coal dependent or disaster prone, which uh, multilateral organizations should look at while engaging with states on just transition. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And again, more interesting perspectives, I think, to, to bring to the discussion, um, particularly this point around loss of, of revenues. Um, and, and one of the things that we've been looking at a lot at ADB is around this concept of direct, indirect, and then induced impacts associated with, with just transition. Um, and, you know, often we... Uh, the way that that things unfold in countries is project by project, and when you look at a single project or intervention, then you can um, you can understand the direct and potentially indirect impacts. But those induced impacts need someone to to manage and monitor that at a more programmatic level, and that's actually where transitions have have failed in the past. Once you look at those induced impacts. Um, so we'll now move on to a, a panel discussion. Um, I think there's lots of interesting points there to, to touch on again. So Ipe, maybe to you first, uh, you, you mentioned some of the um, demands and I think some of the key changes happening in Indonesia that may impact on social protection. Are you already seeing an awareness of this emerging in Indonesia amongst government and other stakeholders? Um, and or programs emerging to, to manage some of these issues? Uh, I think yes and no. Yes part, uh, I mean, no means, uh, I mean, people have still have a challenge to understand what is social security and what will happen next for just transitions. But, but uh, increasing number, number of media coverage and then work as concern uh, are a kind of phenomena now and uh, and, and, and what is very unique here is that the government decided to close one industry. So, so that is really kind of a unique phenomenon. And then that's probably, the, it can justify the government uh, providing more subsidies or increasing non-contributory uh, social security schemes to mitigate uh, challenges. Such discussions going on, uh, in, in my view. And uh, also the government noticed that uh, existing schemes alone cannot solve all the problems. For instance, unemployment benefits schemes cannot uh, cover self-employed by design. So what can uh, the government scheme provide the support uh, to them? And, and, and uh, also, mobility allowances are currently not provided by unemployment benefit schemes. But uh, once uh, the one huge industry is, uh, is retired or disappeared, of course, the whole village and the community will probably have to move to the other places to find a job and raise families. But then, can the government provide any support through taxation uh, the subsidies? The last but not least, um, um, by the labor law, employers are still required to, pro to pay severance if they dismiss the workers. But is it uh, employer's liability to cover this because the government is the one who decided, right, to exit one uh, industries. So, of course, the government has some justifications. I'm not blaming them, but just <laughs> providing some food for thought. Um, uh, can the government uh, support such, a, you know, it, it cover the employer's liability partially or temporarily? So there will be a lot of discussions, and then some of the government officials we are talking to may concern about these issues, and the work as employers also concerned about these issues. So I think uh, I, the ILO is in a good position to listen and continue discussion. Thank you, and I think that's really one of the challenges, right, that the pressure is, huge pressure is on countries to increase climate commitments, to increase the speed at which you're transitioning, increase, you know, the coverage of transition, but it raises these these other challenges um, that the government really then has to, to take on, right, and, and absorb. Um, Maybe to you, Christina, you gave some really interesting examples, I think, of some of the work you're doing in, in many countries. Um, 
and returning a bit to this opportunity side um, that we talked about, what do you think are opportunities to to use social protection um, or those policies as an opportunity to encourage the transition? Thanks so much. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, obviously there, there are two larger groups of people that we need to take into account. And what we see in a lot of the just transition uh, partnership um, plans, uh, implementation plans, is that they often focus on, on workers, in some cases workers and their families, um, but they don't necessarily look at the larger community around um, those workers, so, so basically people who are indirectly affected. And so I think we need to basically come up with different strategies for these different um, groups that are affected and so on the one hand, I mean, we talked a lot about um, the different intervention sort of packages that are required to support the transition from one job to another to more sustainable livelihoods. Um, but I think what is often forgotten is the large number of people that are indirectly affected that may either already live in poverty um, and, and not have a job or may also be too young or too old to actually be part of the labor market. And so I think there it is even more important um, to actually work on the uh, incentive side, so looking at sustainable behaviors, also to what extent or how uh, energy is actually used or even accessed, um, what are the very specific needs of those groups. Um, and so we've seen in, in quite a few countries some interesting approaches where specific existing benefits have already been used, so child or uh, family benefits, for example, to then actually add different types of um, housing-related or energy efficiency-related measures uh, to specifically target those groups and their specific um, also energy needs in the process. Um, and I think in that sense, if, if you actually look at the existing structure of the social protection system, having different um, types of social protection measures addressing the needs of different groups, it's actually really important to, to work with those and to make sure that in the process you don't just look at the labor market transitions and, and you don't just look at um, income issues, but you actually look at the additional vulnerabilities that these, these different groups are facing. Thanks, um, absolutely. And I think that leads really well into my next question, actually, because I think to understand all of these potential issues and, and target um, support and design support effectively needs upstream analytics and, and needs a lot of work. And Mizuho, you mentioned um, in, in your intervention that UNDP is doing some of this work on, on analytics. Um, maybe you could... Um, mention a little bit more about some of this analytical work or where you see the need for support for, for analytical work to help countries with just transition? Yes, and um, I think building on um, Christina's point also, I think the incentivization, the, and to me that also leads to sort of national ownership and also political will to make this change. So, I mean, certainly not a project um, you know, it's, it's not a solution. So I think, um, you know, these new sort of um, um, analytics around the new frontiers of social protection, what is around, I mean, mapping, you know, what's out there. But I think, you know, how do we actually build on them uh, to address the new vulnerabilities uh, would be per particularly important. I think, um, um, and how that feeds also into the policy dialogues are very um, crucial, I think, at this point in time. And um, again, like a UNDP um, certainly plays a role, but I think we do that together with um, the, the, uh, the, the minds of the experts around the table. And I think um, we do that within the UN agency with IFIs, also with development partners to, um, to, to really um, explore these new opportunities. And I think, um, you know, there's certain streams of work that support um, this kind of sort of, um, uh, you know, really collective um, knowledge. And I think one of them is the global accelerator that um, uh, ILO, UNDP, UNICEF are, are leading at the global level as part of the Secretary General's High Impact Initiative. Um, and it it's, of course, uh, very important for the Pathfinder countries to uh, you know, benefit from some of these resource mobilization opportunities and um, you know, invest in research, invest in 
policy change, but I think it's a process of coming to a common understanding and how to bring these different partners and convening um, uh, a dialogue with different partners. And, and uh, I mean, on from the perspectives of financing, from the perspective of labor market policies, but also social protection policies, and all those need to come together. So I think these um, you know, opportunities and uh, work streams um, help partners to come together to um, bring the great minds together and and um, you know uh, generate knowledge and 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 inform the policy dialogue. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, and and absolutely, that partnership um, is becoming even clearer. The more complex, the more we get into to the issue. Um, just. Going back to one of your points on resource mobilisation, and I think, Saranjali, you mentioned that, you know, that staggering figure of one-fifth of government revenue coming from fossil fuels. Um, you also mentioned the importance of the private sector to potentially fill this financing gap. Um, are you finding in, in India that the private sector is aware of this issue of just transition? Um, and are they engaged? in, I think, potential opportunities for, for private sector financing? Yes, Kate, I think there's a growing acknowledgement of the incidence of the transition. Um, of course, to the public budgets, it's more palpable. Um, in terms of how it translates into private sector responding, it, it's a few companies at the moment um, who are in the heart of it sectors who are beginning to have this conversation. So for example, uh, you know, these would be members of Climate Action 100 plus um, that are being asked questions by investors on what they intend to do in terms of reskilling of their employees, as well as, um, you know, their own overall transition plans. But I think in terms of funding, uh, we're also seeing interesting public private partnerships. So, for example, uh, you have the Skill Development Council in India, which is forming alliances with, with the private sector to raise money, to skill people, not uh, just in uh, you know sectors which are aligned with green transition, but overall there's a plan. There is um, across the state partnerships. So if you look at states where they are targeting, also include states that will be affected by this transition. So just to mention that, you know, while I talk about one fifth of the revenues coming from fossil fuels, there are some states, about four to five states, which are even more heavily dependent because of these uh, mining as well as uh, resource endowment being located in those states. So there is some thinking. I think private sector is beginning to engage more on what it means in terms of these states having their own plans for transition. So there is some talk around it. I think the other source of of finance, which is quite interesting, is the corporate social responsibility funding, which is mandated for India. So 2% of the average profits in the last three years have to be put into, uh, into sectors that have been predefined or identified. And I think there's great scope to scale that up. There have also been uh, fiscal innovations in the past. So for example, there's something called the District Mineral Fund. Uh, which is put aside through uh, for on uh, as a proportion of royalties uh, that are earned or paid uh, from mining. And what we've seen in the past is, is that these have remained unutilized. And now there is effort to use that alongside private capital that might be available uh, in order to scale efforts to reskill to support communities. Uh, I think. The last one that I've already mentioned is, is the sovereign green bond issuance. I mean, I'm conscious of the fact that states have their fiscal rules to adhere to, uh, but there is interest even at the municipal level. So we always talk about um, you know national governments or even sub-national, but this is the lowest tier of government. So there are municipal governments that are now issuing green bonds uh, and are looking at transition bonds to support um, the local economy as well as uh, you know the, the the job opportunities or communities. So I think uh, there are several examples in India uh, that have the potential to be used for scaling up of finance. Thank you so much. 
Um, I want to make sure we leave some time for audience questions, but I think there's one point we, we didn't touch on, which uh, even Sarangeli mentioned these different levels of, of government, and that's governance around just transition. And I know, uh, Christina, that's an area that, that you've looked at a lot. Um, maybe you can just provide some quick comments on the issue of governance and maybe the challenges associated with it. I just have one quick um, addition, actually, to what uh, Sarangeli just said. Uh, in terms of financing, and it, it just uh, a number just popped into my head because we actually um, need to remember that last year I think we reached a record of about uh, I think seven trillion uh, a year uh, spent on fossil fuel subsidies in a world where the year before mm, countries had actually committed to phasing out at least inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. And I mean, obviously not all of those seven trillion are actually uh, direct fossil fuel subsidies. I think that's only about 600 um, billion. But still, um, that number is uh, awfully close to what we would need to actually cover social protection floors globally. And so I, I don't wanna say, you know, we should be phasing out all those uh, subsidies and, and spend all of that on, on social protection floors because that's very context specific what is actually needed in different countries. But I think sometimes we also have to remind ourselves that uh, there is actually a lot of money out there being spent right now um, that we can also use differently. Um, yeah, just one quick thought on, on governance. Um, I think it's really interesting when you look at countries that have already undergone major transitions. Um, in many of those places, uh, you start with a national level just transition uh, strategy. In many countries globally, I think about 50 at this point, have already either started working on it, have developed it, or have committed to doing so. Um, but the difficult thing is, I think, um, when looking at governance mechanisms throughout the transition, I mean, you obviously have many sectors involved. You need to develop different uh, sector-specific just transition plans that actually align with those national strategies. Um, but not enough. In many countries, you also have very decentralized systems. And um, an example that came to mind, actually, that I thought was quite interesting was uh, Spain, um, which developed regional level agreements uh, across different government sectors, also with uh, employers and employees. So I bet the ILO would be interested in that example uh, to basically negotiate what is actually uh, needed for implementation at regional level. And so I think um, that is a very good example to, to break it down even further and actually look at implications for specific regions because um, especially in countries that are very decentralized, um, also looking at places like Indonesia, for example, with many different islands, I think those uh, region-specific approaches are, are really important. And so getting uh, different levels of government involved also even in that early formulation phase is really important. Yeah, thank you. And I think, you know, where institutions like ADB can support is on, you know, regional economic diversification, right, and looking at those um, potentially vulnerable regions um, and that concept of early interventions um, for support. So um, we have about eight minutes left, I think. Um, so we have quite a big audience here. Uh, so um, over to you, we would welcome any questions. I think there's a roving um, microphone at the back if anyone would like to ask a question. Sure, uh, maybe I'll start with a question. Um, most of the typologies on climate response we look at use the conventional mitigation and adaptation model. Occasionally you see some refer to dual action um, but it's typically a very tiny percentage of the total. And if we look at short to medium term responses, you know, responding to a climate shock, you need adaptation. If you're dealing with closing down a coal-fired power plant, you need retraining and, and really clear mitigation measures. But if you take a few steps or maybe a few kilometers back and have a very long planning horizon, and we know climate change is a very long-term proposition. Um, is, is anybody looking at the very long-term investments that are dual action, expanding inclusive digital technologies, investing in the kind of human and cognitive capital that build a more resilient future labor force, uh, 
Um, these seem to have really high returns, but they're also dual action. A smart economy is both a resilient economy and an economy that can roll with the punches that disruptions from climate change mitigation will bring. Um, who's doing the work on this long-term planning? Thank you, it's an excellent question. Um, maybe I'll make a quick comment and then pass to my panelists. So um, I think one of the key changes that we've seen that will support that work is that Originally, climate policies um, and nationally determined contributions, which were shorter term plans, sat very much within the Ministry of Environment and they were seen as environmental policies and also often seen as um, external to respond to an external UNFCCC process. We're now seeing a much greater shift where climate change is moving um, across to also be uh, within ministries of economy, ministries of planning, ministries of finance. And with that, you get a much greater integration of the issues of long-term climate planning with long-term development planning. Um, and along with that uh, long-term strategies work, you are starting to see a more convergence where long-term resilience pathways are being done integrated with long-term decarbonisation pathways. There's still a split, but I think that cross-government um, involvement is one of the really critical levers to, to help to bring that together um, and also to stop looking at climate change as an isolated agenda but more as a, a national development agenda. So other key agendas such as digitalisation, how do they interact and how do you bring that together as part of a, a policy or program, um, programming approach? Um, any of the other panellists like to comment on, on that question? Yeah, just a, a quick note on it. Uh, who is looking at it or rather who should be looking at it I think are two different uh, questions or rather answers. Uh, I think the should part refers to essentially all of us because I think also the social protection community needs to look at this. Uh, specifically when we look at um, financing also on the contributory side of things, we need actuaries to actually look at what is the financing side do over the next you know, five to 10 uh, to 50 years. Um, to what extent can people actually continue to contribute or will increasing numbers and, and higher severity of shocks actually make it impossible for people to contribute on a regular basis? And so even we can, even the, uh, the existing contributory structures that we have, and obviously even more uncertainty also on the, the tax finance side. And so I think the, the short answer to that one is I think all of us uh, need to be looking at this. Um, the interesting thing is that the climate community is already looking at climate action as a more integrated concept now. So you see less of a division between adaptation and mitigation in, in recent discussions, also in um, the way the IPCC reports are now being discussed. Um, there was a very interesting concept floating around at the last uh, COP27 that people were all of a sudden talking about just resilience because we also need a just process on the adaptation side. And a lot of people were then very quickly saying this is nonsense because just transition also needs to include climate change adaptation because we all need to adapt no matter what we do at this point. Um, adaptation will be essential. Um, also for a just transition to succeed. And so eventually at this point, um, we know that we need to be looking at both in an integrated way. And so I, I hope with the discussion today, we touched upon both adaptation and mitigation enough to make that clear, but. Maybe I can make one. Yeah, maybe I, I make a really qu quick two points. Uh, the government of Indonesia has the investment strategies in, in renewable energy or just energy transitions, and it's available online. And so they have a long-term uh, strategy how they are going to invest in. And then also the government aims to digitalize all the government services. I don't know how it will work. Uh, that's in the long-term development plan. And last but not least, uh, as we are coming from social security backgrounds, um, one of the I think uh, missing element in the usual discussion is that uh, investment of social insurance fund. The, usually the pension fund is huge, like billions of dollars is staying there. W but what is the investment policy of pension fund in each country? Provident fund, 
or any countries have any kinds of pension funds. But so if we look at how they invest, what uh, investment portfolio, probably we, we are not aware of that in detail, but uh, probably that's one point I want to make. Um, thank you. I'm conscious of the time. I think we could have this discussion for a long time. Um, were there any other audience questions? Please. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. This is Farzana Reza from ILO Country Office, Bangladesh. Though uh, it's quite a question about the coordination because I have seen the panelist and moderator, it is the combination of the development partners and the UN agencies as well. So far, I am from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, it's not from ILO perspective, but there is uh, whatever in the first session we said that the yes, the social protection, then the just transition. We have very technical terminologies. So the question is around the country like Bangladesh where uh, we have a huge informal sector around the 84% and the formal sector only at the 16 to 15%. So uh, from the regional perspective, what you are making strategy, not only the ILO, the all agencies to uh, to more focused on like country like Bangladesh who are like behind to addressing all the just transition and the social protection because in our country we have uh, almost 116 social security programs which is tax finished but now we ILO is with the other UN agencies the UNDP UNICEF we are working for the social insurance and the active labor market policies. But again, uh, we have uh, another one, the just transition. So the main question is, the, what is the you know, regional, uh, like you have uh, so many strategy, the development. Uh, so the focus on the Bangladesh to mitigate the, you know, the social protection and as well the just transition. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Ms. Uha, can you, can you speak on Bangladesh from, or maybe some of the programs from UNDP's angle? Not to put you on the spot, <laughs> but otherwise, Christina? Sure. I mean, it, it is a little difficult because I'm not very familiar with the, the context specifically, but I think um, an earlier session actually touched upon the language, right, and how we actually talk in very technical terms and concepts that are not familiar, other people are not familiar with. And so I think um, we need to essentially break it down to what matters to individual people. So what can we do for the individual for their livelihood perspective to be more sustainable so that they don't just have food and an income today, but also tomorrow to kind of make that very clear why it's actually important to invest in a more sustainable livelihood opportunity today. And we also need to make sure that um, different basic needs, so also including energy needs, are actually met and that the, the right um, option or solution for people is actually also the cheapest one. And I think that's a, a really key question. As soon as people don't actually have access to affordable energy, they're going to you know, use whatever coping mechanism there is, even though it may be harmful for the climate. Um, but I think in a lot of um, economies, you already see that shift happening where the quote unquote right option for people is actually increasingly becoming cheaper. And I think that's also where government investments need to come in on the one hand to support people's income in the process of getting there until it's actually the cheaper option for people to, to do the right thing. And it's also the more sustainable option for them in terms of their future perspective to, to do the right thing for the climate. Thank you. Um, and, and maybe just two points to add on that. I think one of, um, uh, when I mentioned right at the beginning about experience and practical application around a concept like Just Transition, and a lot of the experience that we see are in Europe, in Spain, Western Balkans, Germany, um, and, and this 
issue of the informal sector and the level of informality is is different to the Asia Pacific region. And so for for ADB and and partners working in the region, how we actually get regional specific and regionally appropriate responses on just transition is one of the, the critical issues. I think one of the other positive things today is that we haven't only spoken about the energy sector and maybe that's because these stakeholders here come from the social side. If you um, go on the just transition discussion from the climate side, there's often so much focus on the energy sector, but other key sectors, particularly agriculture, for, for countries like Bangladesh are so critical for, for transition and how we manage a just transition approach in those sectors will also be really important. So trying as practitioners to push the discussion out from only an energy transition discussion is also a, a really critical um, part and one key part of the, the work that ADB is doing um, under its just transition program. Uh, so unfortunately, we're actually already four minutes over time for the session. Um, so I think just a very, very quick wrap up to say a huge thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I think it's been a really interesting discussion. Um, as is the challenge with the topic of just transition, it's very complex and multidimensional. We've touched on far too many issues to sum them up. Um, but I hope that you've enjoyed the discussion and um, I'm sure all of the, the panellists as I are happy to engage further in more detailed conversations. So um, I wish you well for the rest of uh, Asia Pacific Social Protection Week. Thanks very much. And thank you, Saranjali, as well. Yeah.